Pre-calculus honors, da da da, with another lesson today, ba da ba. How's everybody doing out there? Mr. Berto with another virtual lesson for pre-calculus honors. I almost said advanced placement calculus, but you guys aren't quite there yet. Certainly next year for many of you. Um, so this lesson is coming out to you on... Wednesday? I think it's Wednesday, okay, that this is coming out to you? Or is it Tuesday that it's coming out to you? Let's see, I have this written down somewhere. I don't know where it is. Anyway, um, figure Friday, you're going to have a test you got to work on. Thursday, you'll be doing the review ditto. Okay, so I just guess this is Tuesday's lesson here, okay? Um, next week and the week after, a lot of AP exams that people have, uh, scattered times during the day. I know you're going to be overwhelmed. Things are going to be crazy. I think what I'm going to do is just post for two weeks. Um, you guys can work on the review sheets for the final. There's really only like one or two problems that we haven't gotten to, so you could do the other problems. Um, won't nearly be enough work to really cover two weeks, but I'm thinking let's take a back seat here, let you do well on your AP exams, and then you got to come back full force, okay? You can't be like, well, now I'm going to do nothing because AP's over. Da -da. This uh, class is still going to exist. We got things to do. All right, so let's get a little recall action going. Star recall. All right, and we've been talking about integration okay and there's a couple or really a few right now basic integration rules okay don't forget for a while a few lessons all we had was the integral of u to the n with respect to u okay so that's really if you want to integrate a uh, one single letter raised to numerical power rewrite the letter add one of the exponent divide by that number add some cookies and we know the exponent can't be equal to negative one Otherwise, you'd be dividing by zero. Even if you have something that's not one single letter raised to numerical power, then you could use this rule right here. You just have to set that thing that's not one single letter equal to U, okay? Enforce this basic rule. And that leads to our next list of famous U's. Famous uh, U's. So famous U's right here. Okay, and, uh, you know, if it's not a basic integration situation, if the argument of a function you want to integrate is not one single uh, x, try to set that argument equal to u, okay? What is the argument usually? Well, many times it's the base of a numerical exponent. That's the base of a numerical exponent. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, but then we learned two other rules, okay? Um, yesterday, we learned the integral of sine u with respect to u or the integral of sinu with respect to you, if you want to say it that way. And then we learn the integral of kosu, the mathematical god, with respect to you, okay? And remember, in a world of derivatives, sine is the good guy and cosine is the bad guy. However, in the world of integrals, that's the world of antiderivatives. Everything is the opposite of what you would normally assume it to be. In a world of integrals, sine is the... Bad guy. Didn't see that coming. A2 Brute. He turns around, stabs you in the back. The integral of sine is negative cosine. And cosines realize the error of his ways. The integral of cosine, positive sine. Don't forget to rewrite that argument. Don't forget to add some cookies. And speaking of that argument, if you have either sine or cosine alone inside an integral and the argument is not one single x, try to set u equal to that argument, okay? It's also a very famous U. That's the argument of a trig function, the argument of a twig function. Argument of a trig function. You know, sometimes you can algebraically manipulate to put something in a form to basically integrate it, um, but with trig, it's very difficult to do, okay? It's not something that you see too often. We're gonna learn two more rules today, okay? We're gonna learn rule four and rule five, and one of those rules is gonna have a popular U over here, the other rule, we'll talk about the U uh, substitution type of situation in the next video, okay? Which is actually the last one for this chapter right here. Um, you know, really quick, maybe the homework. A lot of people get bothered by this problem, okay? So let's do it together. The integral of cosine radical x times dx over radical x. It's kind of weird because a lot of the problems we used to yesterday, there was some extra stuff upstairs, maybe connected by multiplication, that needed to get canceled out downstairs later. When you set up your u substitution, the derivative of u is normally generated downstairs to cancel with the stuff upstairs. This is a little bit different because now there's some extra stuff downstairs. Believe it or not, the derivative is going to be generated upstairs. You know, what does that mean? Well, first off, you got to look at it and be like, is it a U substitution situation? There's no way this is a U substitution situation. The argument of cosine is not one single X. And you also see division going on here as well. You can't do any algebra. If you think you can cancel these two things out, I'm aghast of you. Okay, we will radical X divided by radical X is one. That's not radical X. What is that, everybody? 
Very good. The cosine of radical X, okay? So be very, very careful. But remember, you know, if it's not a basic integration situation and you can't algebraically manipulate to make it into a basic integration situation, pick a U. It's all U. Um, you know, and I really think there's only one viable U here. What would you set U equal to? Very good. I'd set U equal to radical X as well. You know, and the reason why is because it's the argument of the trig function, okay? You're trying to force this basic rule. If you just see cosine alone in an integral, usually this is the basic rule you'll end up forcing. And that means we want to set U equal to the argument of a trig function. Here's where things get a little nasty because there's two ways to do this, believe it or not. Some people have set U equal to radical X one way. And then in their next step, they'll actually say, oh, U is equal to X to the one half power. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it actually gets a lot more crunchy than you might think. Because remember, now it's du over the derivative of u is equal to dx. And when you get this derivative, you drop the one half down like it's hot, you rewrite the x, you raise it to the one less. One half minus one is negative one half. You gotta simplify this situation over here. And it caused people, it causes people to have trouble. You know, first off, when you divide by one half, same thing as multiplying by two. Okay, so you could actually put the two upstairs okay you divide by one half you're multiplying by two but then when you have x to the negative one half you could bring him upstairs make him x to the positive one half and then the du is going to be next to him so really we end up with two radical x du equal to dx some people struggle with that algebra they're like berto i don't know how you got from there to there well there's actually a reason that i asked you to do something a little bit earlier in the curriculum and that was to memorize what the derivative of radical x is because if you know what the derivative of radical x is it makes this algebra a lot easier remember the derivative of radical x is one over two rad x if you simplify it Okay, and remember, if you divide by a fraction, same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. Only Rourke would divide by 1 over 2 rad x. The rest of us, we're going to multiply by 2 rad x over 1, and 2 rad x over 1 times du is just 2 rad x du, and that's going to be equal to dx. Same thing, okay? You know, if you want, you could have done this, you know, taken this piece and made it equivalent to this at this step, and then it'll be a lot easier to get to your answer. Regardless, it bothers people, and then all of a sudden things are generated upstairs, but that's good. It's good, it's good, good, okay? Because you can see that, you know, we, we call it U substitution, but we should really call it two substitution, very good. So now when I sub out, I'm gonna take out the radical X, replace it with a U. Now I'm gonna take out this DX and replace it with two radical X DU. And now you have a choice of what to do down here with this radical X. Some people are like, oh, radical X is equal to U. I'll put a U down here. Well, if you call radical X down here U, then you should take out this radical X and call it a U as well so that they can cancel out. Don't put a radical X up top and a U downstairs. You know, in fact, just leave the radical X and that'll show you that these radical X's actually cancel out. You know, now this two constant connected by multiplication, bring them out, bring them out. And now we've actually forced that basic rule, okay? Two times the integral of cosine, he's the good guy, that's sine u plus c. And that final step, take out the u, replace it with what you originally substituted for, and whoop, there's our answer, okay? People always struggle with that for some reason when u is equal to, to something with a radical on it. It's really because the negative exponents here and stuff. So try to memorize that derivative. It could help you out a little bit. You know, hopefully the homework wasn't too terrible. Okay, this first page, I'm thinking one, two, and three it should have been easy. They shouldn't have been terrible. Maybe not easy street, but hopefully, you know, not too terrible. Four might have been rough, but we just did that one together. I think five is pretty good. And don't forget something like number six. If you see sine and cosine together in the same integral, try to set the one that's being raised to a power other than one equal to u, okay? You know, that's why I set the sine x equal to u over here. That's why I ended up with u squared. And you want to be thinking ahead of time, you know, like, I got to get rid of this cosine x right here. But remember, if you set u equal to sine x, the derivative of sine x is cosine x, he's going to be generated downstairs. Those things are going to cancel out, okay? There are multiple ways to do these problems. Uh, this one, can you do it by setting u equal to cosine x? I actually don't think that you can, um, but there are other ways to do this, integration by parts and such, things that we won't really talk about in this class. Uh, moving on to number seven and number eight. Seven should have been pretty doable. Bothers some people because of the chain rule here. So you might not actually had that two downstairs. Okay, you might have had a one third here, negative one third. That would be incorrect. Uh, take a look out for number eight, very similar to one that we did in uh, class yesterday. Okay, actually, I think it's the exact same problem as when we did in class uh, yesterday. We did number nine. Do we do number nine together? No, number nine's a little weird, okay? You know, uh, put us, we did number 10 together. Yeah, I have a star next to number nine. Try not to worry about this one. There's multiple ways to do it. I set u equal to sine 3t. Um, can you do it if you set u equal to this entire expression? 
I think you can, okay? There's multiple ways to do these problems. If you do it this way, what really bothers people is the this step to this step. When you actually integrate u squared with respect to u, we know it's u cubed over three. When you integrate one with respect to u, it's not x. What do you take the derivative of with respect to u to get one? That's u, okay? And that bothers a lot of people there. Try not to worry about number nine, seriously. Even if you wanna be an AP calculus, I mean, if you wanna be a BC student, you should understand what's going on with number nine. But even AB, even an upper level AB kid, um, you don't need to worry about that so much. It's just antiquated. You'll see stuff like this in college, but it's not really on the AP exam anymore. But that's why we talk about it, you know, a little bit in class. Number 11, Similar to number 10 from yesterday, the base of a numerical exponent, if you set it equal to u, it's not a horrible problem. And 12 is not too terrible as long as you perform an, an algebraic technique first and you distribute. Remember, when you distribute the sine t, cosine t, then you want to distribute the dt. Really, it's just two separate integrals. Each of them can be done with u substitution. It's just that I used u substitution for one and I used v substitution for another. Technically, you shouldn't use u twice because you can't say u equals sine t and u equals cosine t at the same time. That's ambiguous. You could say like u sub one and u sub two if you really want to confuse yourself. Anyway, there are multiple ways to do this problem as well. I wouldn't worry about it so much. Once again, if you want to be in BC, you got to know how to do all this stuff, okay? And it shouldn't be too much of an issue for you. Uh, a, B, it's really not that bad either. It's a very doable problem. So try it out, okay? I hope that you did try it. Let's get some, uh, you know, teaching going on here. A little lesson action. You know, as far as what we're going to talk about today, well, I don't even have room for my topic sentence, so I'll put it down here. Star! Today we're going to talk about integrals of transcendental functions. Integrals of transcendental, transcendental functions. Oh, functions, I love you so. Now it's starting to sound like Mr. Buckman. I'm really losing it. Um, you know, integrals of transcendental functions, really, um, there's a lot of different functions that could be considered transcendental. Today, we're really focusing on the integral of e to the x and an integral that involves ln x, okay? So let's start over here with the integral of e to the x. Should actually pretty be pretty easy. You know, remember the most basic way to integrate? That's somebody's derivative in there. Whose derivative? The answer's derivative. And you, you know, what do you take the derivative of with respect to x to get e to the x back? You're right, you get e to the x plus c. You know, recall that the derivative with respect to x of e to the x is, excuse me, equal to e to the x. So some people are like, oh wow, that's really easy. It's like the easiest rule that there is. Well, you need to be careful with something like this over here. A lot of people are like, oh, if you integrate e to the three x, you just get back e to the three x plus c. But that's not right. Let's put a little not equal to sign over there. You know, if you wanna know why it's not right, just take the derivative to check, right? If we take the derivative with respect to x of e to the 3x plus c, you know, think about what that's equal to there. The derivative of e to the 3x, you do rewrite e to the 3x, but don't you remember you multiply by 3? Chain, 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 roo Okay, if you want to take the derivative of a function whose argument is not one single x, you take the derivative of the outside function, rewrite that inside function, that argument, then multiply by the derivative of the argument. Obviously, the derivative of c is equal to 0. We actually get 3 e to the 3x, which is not the same thing that I have in my integrand, okay? So you wanna be careful when you write this basic rule down, it's a very dangerous basic rule. So here's number four that we're talking about right here. You know, and here's the rule, the integral of, it's not e to the x. e to the x is the basic integration situation. Maybe it's e to the sine x. Maybe it's e to the, you know, uh, ln x plus five or something like that. So we say the integral of e to the u with respect to u, and you do indeed get back e to the u, and then you add C, but this is only going to work when U is one single letter, only when you have E raised to one, what am I even writing here? Only when E is raised to one single letter does this work right here, this formula, one single letter. In the previous problem we just did, E was raised to the 3x power. 3x is not one single letter, okay? Now, you can force it to be one single letter by setting it equal to one single letter, and the one single letter we always set it equal to is u. So if you actually set that 3x equal to u, well, then you'll end up with e to the u when you integrate. Just don't forget that it's two substitution, okay? You know, du over the derivative of u, which is 3, is going to be equal to dx. So when I perform my two substitutions here, I get the integral of e to the u, but then I got to take out that dx. I got to replace him with a du over 3. 
and this is a little bit different now when you bring out the three, it's not even a three, it's a one third, you get one third times the integral of e to the u with respect to u, and now you force the basic rule, now you have e raised to one single letter, pull the one third to the side, if you wanna integrate e to the u, you get back e to the u, plus cookies, and then don't forget, now we have one third e to the, do that resubstitution, take out the u, plug in the three x, and then put the plus c, that's our appropriate answer. You could see if we took the derivative of this here, we multiply by three afterward, it would cancel with the one third and you'd just be left with the e to the three x. So it's actually a very dangerous rule. If you wanna integrate uh, e to raise to the something power, that something power had better be one single letter. And if it's not one single letter, you're gonna force it to be one single letter using u substitution. In fact, that's our third most famous u right here, the exponent of e the exponent of e. E! And we know e, the exponent of e is just the argument of e. That's what all these famous u's are. They're all just arguments. This u is the argument of a polynomial function or perhaps a rational function or a radical function, depending on the situation. These u's are just the argument of a trig function. And this u right here, that's the argument of e, okay? That's his exponent right there. So these problems are really not too difficult to do, as long as you realize if e is only raised to one single letter, dive right in there, folks, and integrate. But if e is not raised to one single letter, you must force it to be raised to one single letter by setting the exponent of e equal to u. Like this guy over here. This is not basic integration. It'd only be basic integration. You know, at first you see that x cubed. You're like, that. that's pretty hot right there. That's basic integration. But it's cannot, not connected by addition or subtraction to the e. It's multiplication, which we know is an issue right there. The other issue is that this is not e raised to the one single letter. That's e raised to the x to the fourth power. So really, it's not basic integration. And there's no algebraic manipulation here that could cause E to suddenly be raised to only one single letter, okay? Um, so there's nothing you could do uh, algebraically, which means you gotta pick a U. And I'm telling you, if you see E, E, inside, you know, an integral, try to set U equal to the exponent of E, which we know here is X to the fourth. X to the fourth! You know, and now already, the gears should be turning in your mind. You should be like, you know what? the derivative of x to the fourth is going to get generated downstairs and that derivative is 4x cubed and that means the x cubes are going to cancel out i'm going to pull a one fourth to the side integrate e to the x to the fourth and get e to the x to the fourth plus c back see that's uh mental integration that's integration by observation when you get good you could do that you don't need to okay but at least you should be thinking you know what du over the derivative u which is 4x cubed is equal to dx and you should be thinking that x cubed down there is going to cancel with this x cubed up here so remember now we perform our you know, it's funny because they call it u-substitution, but I think they should really call it two-substitution indeed because we sub out for two things. Not the x cubed, he's still there, but, but, not for long. Um, we now make this e to the u, take out the dx, replace it with a du over 4x cubed. You know, remember, the four is not gonna go away, just the x cubed cancel out. And that's the important thing, the variables have to cancel out because you can't integrate x with respect to u. This is a constant, a one fourth connected by multiplication, pull them to the side. Then you'll notice we're left with the integral of e to the u with respect to u, which is very easy, e to the u plus c. Just don't forget that last step, one fourth e to the x to the fourth plus c. You gotta practice these. If you practice these, you'll get good at them, okay? If you start messing around, you just wanna look at things and know what the answer is right away. It's not really gonna work for you for integration, okay? So just be careful. Um, another rule that we're gonna learn, the integral of one over x with respect to x. People like the integral of one over x, you know, just some weird rational function, what's that about? Well, ln is involved. In this class, we actually don't ever integrate ln x. Um, I don't even think in BC calculus, we actually integrate the ln of x. I don't know, maybe we do. How do we do an integral of ln x? I don't even know, okay? I have to take another look at that. Uh, so I don't think you're even gonna see it in BC next year, but if you do, don't worry, we'll be on top of it then. Um, but this does involve ln. It has it involve ln. Remember, the easiest way to integrate anything, that's somebody's derivative in there. Whose derivative? The answer's derivative. You should remember what you take the derivative of with respect to x to get one over x back. We talked about this and that's ln x, okay? So we don't actually integrate ln x, but we integrate rational expressions to get an answer of ln x plus c back. But be careful, the integral of one over x with respect to x is actually equal to ln absolute value x plus c. Um, some people are like, you know, what the heck is that absolute value? Where does it come from? Well, it just comes from your knowledge of y equals ln x. You know, if you graph y equals ln x, 
you know, right now at your seats, you should be able to sketch a quick, quick graph of LNX. Some people are like, what is he, crazy? I can't sketch that graph. You better be able to. You want to be an advanced placement student. Doing things like this are going to make problems easier. You're going to be able to come up with stuff like this. You're going to have to. All right, so here's Y equals LNX. That's what it looks like. And remember the domain. You could only have the argument of LN be greater than zero. It's got a vertical asymptote right here at X equals zero. And certainly it doesn't exist to the left of the origin. So whatever you put inside an LN always has to be positive. That's why we have the absolute value. You know, if this X was a denominator, a denominator could be negative. It can't be zero, but it could be negative. There's nothing wrong with that. But after you integrate, you gotta make sure there might be some X values that work for this original function, but they don't work for your new integral. They won't mess with you with this. Whenever you do an integral and LN is involved in the answer choices, they'll have absolute values. There won't be one without an absolute value. So really it's kind of more of like a, a formality, but technically it's really important, okay? Because if you plug in X equals negative two here, no problem. Problem, but if x equals negative 2 here, you have an issue. You can't take the ln of that. And that's a basic integration situation when you have 1 over 1 single letter raised to the first power. See, if this is 1 over x squared, you'd make it x to the negative 2. And that would be, you know, a basic integration situation like the ones we did earlier in the curriculum right here. But remember what we said. What if n is equal to negative 1? You know, if n is equal to negative 1, this becomes u to the negative 1 the integral of u to the negative one with respect to u, which is the integral of one over u with respect to u. That's the rule we just did, okay? So that's down here, rule number five, star, little star, star. Okay, the integral of one over u with respect to u. Well, we did the integral of one over x. That was the basic situation. Maybe it's not one over one single x. Maybe it's one over x squared plus two, you know, something like that. We'll actually deal with those types of problems tomorrow. One over x squared plus two would be rough. One over three x plus three, very doable. Um, but remember, if it's the integral of one over x with respect to x, it would be ln absolute value x plus c. Since it's the integral of one over u with respect to u, ln absolute value u plus c, okay? And, um, We'll talk about the U substitution situation for this. We actually have a couple different things that we could do. We don't even add it to the list, and that's something we'll speak about tomorrow. For now, if you wanna integrate one over one single letter that's raised to the first power, that's an LN type of situation. Just like over here, okay, you know, before we had one over X, now we have five over X. Remember, this is really the same thing as the integral of five times one over X with respect to X. You know, that constant connected by multiplication, you could always pull them to the side. You could even bring them out, bring them out of the entire integral sign. Okay, and now we have the same thing we had last time, okay? The five is over here, however, it's the only difference. The integral of one over X, ln absolute value X plus C, and that's why we get five ln absolute value X plus C. You could take the derivative of this if you want to, to check, not really necessary to do. And at that point, you kind of ignore the absolute value sign. Um, we'll speak more about stuff like that <clears throat> in the future. You know, another pretty popular one that was similar to one that we did a little bit uh, earlier in this in this topic. A lot of people know it's not basic integration. Each of these terms separately would be great. The problem is they're connected by division right here. Um, you could try to factor, but factoring is actually going to be an issue because if you factor an X out of the top, it's not going to cancel with everything downstairs, right? You know, then it would actually become what? Just uh, cancel those. You'd get X squared minus 3 over x, which is not bad, but you still need to do something. You're still in the same situation. And the something you need to do is what we're going to do in the original case right here. You know, when you have terms connected by addition or subtraction over one single term, split the divisions, get a little many over one going. And I talked about a few lessons back that many over one would be stronger than factoring for this type of situation right here, because now this actually becomes the integral. Now we get x cubed over x squared minus 3x over x squared. Just be careful, you've now turned a quotient into a quantity. So make sure you get those parentheses there. Okay, that little subtraction sign going. Um, and then x cubed divided by x, we know by, divided by x squared is just x, minus 3x over x squared is three over x. Now we've actually put it in a pretty good form to integrate. Um, it would be a little bit nicer if we change it to x minus three times one over x with respect to x, then you'll see it's similar to this situation down here. You could have got that from here, by the way. Uh, split the divisions now. You'll get x squared over x, which is x, uh, minus 3 over x, which we had right here, okay? So really, many over one's actually a little bit more powerful than factoring. Now, don't forget your basic integration. I had to integrate x to the first. That's x squared over 2. Minus, pull the 3 to the side. Integrate 1 over x. Ln absolute value x plus c. And whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. Whoop, dead is. Come on now. Whoop, dead is. Okay, look. Um, you know, 
not really a horrible problem, but you have to start recognizing these types of things, okay? There's a lot of things to recognize, and that's why we practice. If you see, um, you know, a constant over an X to the first power or a letter raised to the first power, try to think an LN situation. Really, it's this. If you want to integrate a quotient and the bottom's only being raised to the first power, that's when it's an LN situation. These are the really simple ones. We'll get into the, the more complicated ones in the next ditto, which is technically the last lesson, okay? That's Wednesday's lesson. Thursday, I have a nice little review ditto with the answers attached, okay? So you could try those problems out. And then, uh, you know, Thursday night, your homework, you could get started on the, the take-home assignment that I'm going to give out. Um, you can work on it Friday. And we'll have it due, you know, Friday by midnight, I'd say, because let's get it out of the way, because you got eight Ps the week after. Then we're going to be on essentially almost a two-week break, okay? I'll, but I will be giving you, uh, you know, final review dittos that you better work on and try. Um, then when we come back, we'll get into uh, the next topic. And maybe we'll talk about those final review ditos as well. You know, maybe post a couple of videos of me doing those solutions. So we'll see what happens there. Okay, remember, you know, integration, you know, of transcendental functions here. The integral of e to the u is equal to e to the u plus c. Make sure e is raised to one single letter. And the integral of one over u, ln absolute value u plus c. Please try the homework tonight. Coming back to you with another video tomorrow. Hope everybody's healthy and safe and you're uh, practicing for those AP exams. Make sure you practice uploading responses and stuff like that. I got to talk to my uh, AP students about that soon enough. Anyway, this is Birdo signing off. Adios.